Hello, welcome to the We'll Preach for Food podcast. I'm Doug, I'm pastor here at Faith Lutheran Church. We're based out of Shelton, Washington. We're a congregation of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Faith is a welcoming community growing closer to and more like Jesus, making Christ known joyfully, serving each other, our neighbors, and all God's creation. You can learn more about faith at our website, www.faithshelton.org. I want to thank you for listening today. Today's message is in response to some big stuff that folks are going through right now in our congregation and in our world. There's a war in Ukraine, a young woman recovering from a major cancer surgery in our congregation, a colleague grieving a stepson's suicide, the funeral of a longtime friend and member of this congregation. From the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we're going to read about a storm. Storms are real things, of course, but they also serve as a metaphor for some of the overwhelming challenges and circumstances in which we find ourselves, like this week, for instance. So please open your Bible to Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 22. Today's podcast is for the second Sunday in Lent, March 13th, 2022. The title of this podcast is Storms, Cancer, and War. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, the 8th chapter, beginning at verse 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake, so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith? he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Storms happen. Storms are a natural part of God's good creation. Sometimes they're even beautiful. Storms are scary and dangerous, especially when you're in the middle of one. Jesus and his disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee, and a squall sets in over them. The wind and the waves and rain threaten to capsize the boat. The disciples are rightly afraid for their lives. They wake a sleeping Jesus and state their worst fear, We're going to die! Mark's account of the story has the disciples even more incredulous. We're going to die, Jesus. Don't you even care? In response, Jesus says something to the storm. The water calms and the wind stops. He turns to the disciples and asks, where is your faith? The disciples turn to one another and say, who is this guy? This story from Luke is a story about a literal storm. Storms are also a metaphor for circumstances we find ourselves in, circumstances that are scary and dangerous, that reveal a lot about ourselves, our faith, our priorities. The war in Ukraine feels like a storm these days. It may be over there, but the pictures and footage show people who look a lot like you and me, northern European white folks. Soldiers and citizens, women and men, young and old, Now, Mr. Putin of Russia seems to be the one most responsible for this invasion, but it would be naive, I think, to think that we could end the conflict simply by removing Putin from the equation, even if we could. My daughter, Hannah, is a lieutenant in the U.S. Army who's been stationed in South Korea. She does things like tanks and armored vehicles. Well, this week she arrived back in the United States, back in El Paso, safe and sound, And I am thankful and relieved that my little girl is further from harm's way. At the same time, there are thousands of other soldiers and sailors, daughters and sons and fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters who are still in harm's way. And army life itself is harmful, Hannah has come to experience. She notes that it fosters unhealthy patterns of living and relating and coping. That military life exploits the poorest and most desperate young people in our country. The army itself is a storm, she says. Closer to home, a two-year pandemic storm has been raging. Half a billion cases worldwide to date. 
There have been a million deaths attributed to COVID in the United States alone. And while masks are coming off this week, as the disease runs its course, as vaccinations and immun- immunities create a new normal, the impact of the storm will linger for a long time. The continued effects of COVID itself, the toll it's taken on health cares and workers and educators, families, businesses, even churches. Suicide is another kind of storm. When waves of despair finally overwhelm a person such that they take their own life, family and friends are left with grief and guilt and anger. In the aftermath of his stepson's suicide this week, our dear friend admitted to me that he simply feels nothing right now. His whole system is in shock, shut down, a survival mechanism in our bodies when we can't process all the feelings. So our bodies just shut it all off until we can sort it out later. And then there's cancer. 15 million cancer diagnoses every year in the United States. Cancer is almost always storm life. It takes us by surprise. It's dangerous, life-threatening. Beth and Mike have only been a part of this church family for a few months, but Beth's cancer storm began a couple years ago, and this weekend, days before her 25th birthday, she had surgery to remove the leg that held the cancer that threatens to capsize her life. Don't you care, Jesus? Now, she seems to have made it through the surgery well. God willing, the cancer is gone, the chronic pain will diminish, the wound will heal without infection, and she will become one of those cancer survivor success stories we love to hear. And all this is going on as the people of faith gather this weekend to pay our respects and entrust to Almighty God, a dear brother in Christ, Guy Lucinian. His long, full life has had its own share of heartache and storms the death of his own son, a debilitating stroke, a wife's slow descent into dementia. (sighs) Like I say, it's been a week. I've found myself in a bit of shock. I've been tired. I've struggled to concentrate. I have forgotten appointments, failed to show up uh, and follow up with several important phone calls and visits. I say this not to make excuses or to elicit sympathy from anybody. It's, it's not my leg being amputated. It's not my daughter fighting in Ukraine. I tell you this because you need to know that storms are scary. Storms are overwhelming. And the, the farther you are into the middle of it, the harder it is. And I want to tell you that it's okay at times to simply recognize that there's a lot going on. To be kind to yourself. and Be patient with yourself. Someone suggested to me that maybe I should just preach an old sermon this week. Nobody would know the difference, she assured me. Except that sermons are how I process my life and faith and God and the universe every week. So I want to share with you some of what I've been noticing and learning about storms, about God, and about myself. Like I say, storms happen. They are necessary, natural, beautiful, and dangerous, and God made them this way. If you've ever lived in a certain area for a while, you can start to recognize the signs of a coming storm in that region. The fact that the storm catches up to a group of fishermen by surprise, well, that, that itself is surprising. Were they somehow under the impression that following Jesus would make them safe, that Jesus would protect them, would prevent storms and danger, preserve and protect them from bad things ever happening to them? (laughs) You who've been following Jesus for a while, what's your experience, O listener? Has your faith protected you from the storms? Has your faith led you right into the heart of the storm? New Christians are often surprised when they learn that Jesus is not a uh, get-out-of-jail-free card. Some disingenuous pastors and and churches preach a sort of prosperity gospel that implies if you have enough faith that God will heal every illness, take away all your problems, and even make you wealthy. On the other side, when something bad happens, then the blame is right back on you, the person. You must have done something wrong. You didn't pray hard enough. You didn't have enough faith. Sisters and brothers, this is a lie. 
Faith Lutheran Church, we've been relatively insulated from the worst of this COVID pandemic. We've not dealt with any large-scale COVID outbreaks in the congregation, at least not yet. We've encouraged vaccines and masking and distancing. At the same time, there are some of us who took all the precautions and still got the virus. But here at Faith, we don't believe that God is rewarding anybody for wearing a mask or getting vaccinated any more than we think God is punishing somebody for not getting vaccinated. People who take precautions are generally less likely to get sick. That's the way it works. Storms happen. Viruses happen. And cancer happens. Sure, there are some environmental factors, asbestos mines, Agent Orange, burn pits. And there are behavioral factors. Smoking comes to mind. But mostly cancer seems to be about genetics, random mutations, and time. That's kind of a scary idea. And so people for thousands of years have attempted uh, to assign some kind of moral factor to disease, that your sickness is punishment for bad behavior, that your health is a reward for good behavior. But as a result, a person living with cancer or depression or in a war-torn country comes to believe that somehow this is their own fault. And yet again, Jesus' own life and teaching says that this is not true. The Bible says that storms happen. And more importantly, the Bible says that God is faithful in the midst of the storm. When I was a hospice chaplain, I was working with a cancer patient. One morning I walked into her room. She was in pain and distraught. God must be punishing me, she lamented. I decided to try something a little unexpected. Wow, I said with a shocked look on my face. What did you do? And my question surprised her. Well, nothing, she said. (laughs) And then I smiled. And I told her, then it probably isn't that, is it? And I took her hand. And we talked about her pain and her fears and her hopes. By the end of our visit, we read a psalm. And we prayed together to Jesus in the midst of her storm. I also learned in hospice that words matter. A hospice patient is so much more than a terminal illness. We made it a point not to talk about visiting room two or visiting the the COPD patient. No, we're going to visit Mrs. Johnson in room two. We're going to visit Mr. Jones, who's living with cancer. This week, I'm reading a book about cancer, trauma, and ministry. The author brings up the pitfalls of describing someone with cancer as a victim or hero or survivor or warrior, because all of these carry with them a sense that cancer is some, something on the outside to be fought, overcome, beaten. Implied is the idea that if the cancer progresses, then the person has somehow not fought hard enough or isn't up to the task or maybe doesn't have enough faith person living with cancer. That's the way to describe someone. Or maybe just precious child of God. Or maybe just Beth. Today's reading also affirms a couple things that we know about Jesus. We know that Jesus can order the waves and they obey him. We also can see that Jesus can alter natural events but rarely does. I mean, think about it. Apart from the individual healing stories, you can count on the number, uh, count on one hand, the number of times that that Jesus manipulates nature in the Bible. There's that one time with the huge haul of fish. Once or twice, he multiplies the loaves. But even raising from the dead seems to be outside his comfort zone. It's almost as if he tries it out, but like David putting on Saul's armor, he finds that meddling in the natural order of things doesn't fit his mission. Jesus didn't come to send storms into your life as punishment, and Jesus didn't come to save us from all the storms as a reward for good behavior. (laughs) Jesus came to show us faithfulness and love in the midst of the storms of life. Where's your faith? Jesus asks. Because if you only have faith when the waters are calm, you won't have it when you need it most in the storm itself. By the end of the gospel, after Jesus is raised from the dead, after he weathers the storm of death, he appears to these same disciples, 
Peace, he says to them. Don't be afraid, he says to them. I am with you always, he says to you, for my grace is sufficient. Let me leave you with four brief takeaways. The first is this. Grief and anxiety are hard work. The closer you are to the middle of the storm, the harder it gets. So be kind to yourself. The first takeaway is be kind to yourself. Take time that you need. Go for a walk. Talk to someone. Take a nap. Give yourself a break. The second, be slow to judge others or yourself. Storms happen, and life is more random than we're usually willing to admit. Be slow to judge yourself or others. It's not your fault. It's not their fault. Third, storms happen and people are hurting, so be swift to show compassion and love. I'm so proud of Faith for your outpouring of love and prayers and casseroles for Beth and Mike, for all the pies at Guy's reception. Thank you for showing compassion and love when you see other people in the midst of a storm. And the fourth thing, be diligent in prayer, for Jesus is faithful. For by, by all means, pray for healing, pray for miracles, pray for an end to war and a cure for cancer. And then, as you pray, put your faith in Jesus no matter what. Not my will, but thy will be done, O Lord. Amen. Thanks for listening, folks. Thanks, Chaz, for your weekly help producing this podcast. Thank you, people of faith, for sharing this journey with me. Our website, www.faithshelton.org, has resources for um, how you can grow closer to and more like Jesus, ways you can connect to the larger faith community. Maybe you're going through a storm right now and could use some extra prayers. I hope you'll sign up for our weekly emails, like us on Facebook, make a donation to Faith, subscribe to this We'll Preach for Food podcast. And I hope that listening has been as much of a blessing as it has been preparing it. I'm going to leave you with a blessing from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen.